Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimble Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. This week, we present a series of shows recorded at the Pega World Conference in Las Vegas. The theme of the conference was automation, particularly in service of creating enhanced customer experiences. In this episode, I'm joined by Jim Sala, Senior Director of Process and Decision Automation at Scotiabank. Jim is tasked with helping the bank transition from a world where customer interactions are based on historical analysis to one where they're based on real-time decisioning and automation. In our conversation, we discuss what's required to deliver real-time decisioning starting from the ground up with the data platform. In this vein, we explore topics like data lakes, data warehouses, integration, and more, and the effort required to take advantage of these. Before we jump into the interview, I'd like to send a huge thanks to our friends at Pega Systems for hosting me at Pega World and sponsoring this series. One of the great announcements coming out of the conference was Pega Systems' new self-optimizing AI-powered marketing capabilities. This is a really interesting offering designed to reduce marketers' dependence on traditional segment-based campaigns and transition them towards real-time, one-to-one customer engagement. These new capabilities will be available as part of their new Pega Infinity platform, which was also announced at the event. For more info on Pega Infinity, head to pega.com slash infinity. All right, let's do it. All right, everyone, I am here at Pega World in Las Vegas, and I have the pleasure of being seated with Jim Sala. Jim is the Senior Director of Process and Decision Automation at Scotiabank. Jim, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Fantastic. Uh, why don't we get started by having you tell us a little bit about your background? Uh, I understand you've got a long history in this space of decision automation. Sure. Decision and process automation. Sure. Um, uh, so I'm 30 years in IT, uh, 31 years in IT, and um, I've been implementing large-scale automation systems pretty much that whole time. Uh, So I've kind of watched the industry grow and uh, change for many years. Um, Part of my background actually does involve uh, some fairly heavy data modeling in the financial services industry and balance sheet analytics and things like that. So mathematical models and the whole world of AI has kind of just uh, grown up around me and I've I've seen quite a bit of the change. I've spent probably the last uh, three years or so uh, focused a little bit more on Um, actual real-time decisioning uh, as part of my practice of um, process and decision automation. And the reason these two are together is that the bank is very focused not just on, you know, better analytics and better decisions, but on actionable decisions and actually being able to do something with those. Uh, So we've, we've really kind of strategically brought those things together with the intent of, uh, you know, making better decisions and offering better advice and being able to actually follow through with the customer. Okay, awesome. And so for folks that aren't familiar with Scotiabank, uh, you know, tell us about, you know, we get that it's a bank, but tell us about Scotia and maybe a little bit of Scotia's journey with process and decision automation. Sure. Okay. Well, obviously, Scotia's a Canadian bank. We're based in uh, Toronto. Um, We're in uh, over 50 countries throughout the world. We're very heavily uh, invested in uh, LATAM and uh, you know Central America and, and uh, South America, as well, obviously, as Canada. Um, and really, our business is uh, on a major growth curve in the in the Americas uh, in general, not just Canada. Um, we've been, you know, like many banks traditionally, we've been doing um, kind of segment ori- oriented historical. Uh, analytics. And, you know, we use those analytics primarily to make offers to our clients. Um, Over the last few years, we uh, started the curve of uh, automation of work and automation of uh, processes and kind of Six Sigma approach to things. And along with that, we, uh, through our work with Pega, we actually started using um, their real-time decisioning, which is integrated with their process engine. And so what we're finding is Along with you know better real time decisions, 
uh, and I'll talk about that in a second, but along with better real-time decisions, we actually are able to action things and, you know, drive work in our backend system. So as an example, you know, when an offer is taken up, we can actually automate the process of onboarding that product or that client or whatever it is that came out of the offer. Um, we have, uh, you know, we, we've started to move from offers that are, as I said, based on uh, kind of batch data and, and historical data and, you know, the data on our on our existing systems. And we've started to augment them with uh, more real-time data, so streaming data from various, you know, social media and uh, websites and things like that. And what it's giving us is the ability to make a more fulsome decision on behalf of the client. So, um, you know, the example I give people is traditionally – by the time an offer was actually presented to the client, it may be based on data that is weeks to even over a month old. The offer itself could be weeks old because the cycle time to create those offers was, you know, long. And with the the new tools that are coming out in the market, we've got the ability to be much more agile. They bring uh, the data model and the the decision strategies together in one place and make it much simpler to uh, integrate your data and work with your um, with your strategies. And so, what we're now finding is that incorporating real time data and the faster turnaround time to be able to, you know change offers, create offers, change other decisions is giving us uh, the ability to, you know, be a, a more active uh, participant in the conversation with the client and bring them more relevant offers. Okay, great. I- I'm really glad to hear you broach the issue of data because that's something I've been wondering wondering about over the course of the past couple of days here at uh, the conference. Uh, there are a lot of interesting things happening in terms of um, you know, the real-time offers and things like that um, that have been discussed in the keynotes. And one of the questions running along in the back of my mind is, you know, what's really required to make this happen? And what are all the integration points? And, you know, what kind of data does the customer have to have access to? And uh, does, you know, in what ways does, it strikes me that at least to some degree, putting these kinds of processes in place would help them enhance their data? How does Absolutely. that work? Um, it's a feedback. Let's just let's dive into uh, sure. your experiences around uh, the data side of this. Sure. So, you know, as I said, um, a lot of this is driven by the quality of the data that you have about your customers. And traditionally, um, you know, large institutions have kind of taken a data mining, data warehouse approach to and, and using segmentation to look at their clients. And that's great. You get a certain amount of information. You know your client from patterns. They're like this. They're you know they're like other people that we've worked with. Um, what we're trying to do now is to get more down to an individual and a behavioral understanding of our clients. So we're you know, and this is a multi-year journey. You don't do this uh, overnight, obviously. But and, and is that uh, if I can interrupt, is that fundamentally that individual view of the customer fundamentally at odds with the the notion of a data warehouse? I would say that you're not going to achieve it with a data warehouse. Uh, data warehouses are historical data by nature. And what we're trying to do, we, we certainly still embrace the data that we have historically about our clients and the, the data that we uh, you know accumulate in doing our day-to-day business with our clients. That's still very important. And uh, you know, without that, you can't make good decisions. However, beyond that, we're now trying to reach out into, you know, partner networks, understanding, you know, not just things like account balances, uh, you know, basic demographics, but transaction patterns, uh, deposit patterns, payment patterns. Um, and then beyond that, you know, social media, things that they're doing online. An example might be, uh, you know, you want to make an offer to a client for a credit card. That's great. Um, wouldn't it be interesting to know that your client travels a lot or is, in fact, traveling, is, in fact, planning a, a major uh, travel event right now? Uh, if you see them online doing foreign currency rate checks or online looking for airline tickets, well, that might change your offer from, you know, uh, uh, an affinity points to something related with travel benefits. Things like that will happen, okay? Yeah. so Actually, that... that- uh, example resonates with me quite strongly because I do travel a lot. There you go. Uh, and you know, when I see, a, you know, I get the credit card offers like everyone else does, and 
I it, when I see one that is not has no kind of points associated with it or something like right. what are they thinking? Why like, would why would you even why do that? would I even do this? Exactly. exactly. So if on top of that you know that your your bank understands a little bit about your life and is making offers that are more relevant to you, then you know your affinity to the bank grows. So, you know, one of the speakers at the conference uh, yesterday was talking about, you know, customer satisfaction. We've got to move beyond customer satisfaction because everyone is satisfying customers. And, you know, a satisfied customer does not necessarily mean a customer that's going to stay with you. You've got to kind of go beyond that. And, you know, especially the, the changing demographics of our customer base, people expect us to know more about them. It's it's not even a question of, uh, you know, telling us about themselves. They expect you to just know these things. And so, um, and it goes beyond offers, in fact. So if you think about it, being able to give your customer a nudge because you see that they're getting into a situation where they may have a check bounce. You, you're seeing the patterns of deposits and expenditures, maybe even the patterns of things that are coming in on credit cards, and you know you know, you've got a payment coming due. You really need to think about making that payment to avoid a late charge. Those kinds of nudges are considered value add by clients. So being able to say things like that actually makes you more of a uh, a source of financial advice, more of a partner than uh, just a bank selling them products. So that's kind of the next uh, wave of what we're hoping to get into is more value add or advice-based interactions with our clients. And that kind of goes hand in glove with the automation of work. Because if you think about it, we're, we're, the tendency is to automate the repetitive tasks that we do for our clients. And what that does is it frees our people up to be better financial advisors. If you add the intelligence behind that to you know, make more pertinent offers, give nudges to your customers, then it changes the transaction between the bank and the customer from one of just order taking and fulfilling uh, requests to one of actually offering advice and engaging the client. That's the direction we're trying to go with analytics and decisioning. Mm. And so you mentioned pulling in different types of data, transactional, historical transactional data, social, streaming, real time. When I hear this type of data mix, I start to think of data lake. Does that play into it at all for you? It does. Um, you know, we, we don't necessarily use the term data lake for it, but for sure there is the idea of, you know, gathering data. And in fact, by the way, the data that we gather includes the customer journeys that we're doing through the process automation or the, or the decisions and the you know interaction history that we have with the client through making offers and giving nudges. So all of the data that we're getting from all these different sources, including the data that we transact with the customer uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, is being captured and being in some ways curated for different uses and different purposes. And, you know, one of the things that we're curating for is making better decisions and offering our clients better services and products. So, yes, the concept of a data lake definitely uh, plays a key role in this. And in some ways, it's at the the base of the pyramid of value-add decisioning. Because I, I like to say that, you know, it all starts with data from your own backend systems and real-time data and all these things. And it goes up to, you know, kind of understanding insights and intents about your client, knowing, you know, what the most probable next interaction is going to be with your client, or having the insights to say, I understand where they are in their life or in their financial situation, and I can therefore make better uh, offers to them or, or interact with them more intelligently. So it goes from data to intents and insights, up to decisions, and then up to offers and actions. So the top of the pyramid is actually doing something for your client. I got to say that when I'm here and I hear your bank, you and you know other banks have presented, telcos have presented, uh, you've all described this world that sounds you know awesome. Like the, the companies that I'm dealing with know what I'm going to need. Uh, before I express the need or even, you know, as I'm contacting them. But I don't feel like any of the companies I do business with actually do that. Is it, you know, just where we are in kind of the maturity cycle? Is it that I'm just working with, I have the wrong banks and telecos and, you know, all of that? Is it that That's, this stuff is being, is, is currently deployed in like small numbers today? And That's a very good question. So for sure, we're on a journey. 
Um, some of the presenters today were talking about having been working on these things for 10 years. Again, it's, this is not something you, you can create the roadmap, you can have the concepts. Um, it actually takes a great deal of work by many different uh, groups around the bank to make these things happen. So as I said, we're, we're right now in a period where you know, there's a lot of creation of new technologies. These things are coming up all the time. You've got things like you know, transcription, voice transcription, natural language processing, um, sentiment analysis. You've got the, the tools are coming uh, available now. Um, at the moment, many of these tools are still kind of here and there. You've got to figure out how to work with them, figure out how to integrate them into your ecosystem and into your architecture. Um, so some of it is just that because of the level of maturity of these tools, it takes a lot of work and a lot of uh, – you know, experimentation to use these technologies. Now, what I think is going to happen is the creative process will continue. There will begin to be consolidation and you'll start to see platforms. And actually, Pega is one of those platforms that's saying, we've got the core decisioning capability and we've got the core of being able to do work. They're integrating right now with all of these other technologies and it takes work and it takes time. And getting your data layer really nailed down takes time and work and a lot of analysis. There's data scientists and data engineers working flat out on that at our bank. And then what's going to start to happen is we've got pockets of success areas where we're doing this and we're experimenting in other areas. So, you know, we're, we're talking about how to do things in customer service, how to do things in the world of collections or fraud. We're not yet at a point where we're, we're just doing it full out, but we are definitely focusing on it and moving in that direction. So so you mentioned you know, some of your data science teams and data engineering teams. What are they focused on now in, to try to help the enterprise get to this broader vision of real-time decision right. automation? Right. Um, what are their well, big challenges? I think master data management is definitely a big challenge, like knowing that you've got the right copy of every field of data you have on your customers. Um, you know, as I said, um, data lineage or data provenance, uh, making sure that you understand where data came from, where the roots of it are so that you use it correctly. Uh, these are some of the, the industry-wide challenges that I think people are going through. And then, quite frankly, learning the new technologies that allow us to work with data in more agile and more real-time ways. You're not going to do this with classic uh, relational databases. There are new technologies that are coming up and the bank's adopting them. Well, industry is adopting those. So I think the the discipline of data engineering and data sciences is, again, evolving and growing, but it's definitely reaching a level of maturity where there are experts in the field and there is real thought leadership. It's not, you know, guys like me going in and saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invent data engineering. It's, it's there. It's a university discipline and we get to benefit from that now. Uh, for sure, there's, a, there's a, a, you know, a roadmap ahead of us to really nail down our data challenges. What are some of the technologies that are... Uh, kind of on your radar at that data layer well, for helping you get to... Yeah, so I mean, all the the, the classic ones, you know, the Hadoop type uh, data tools and, uh, well, let's put it this way. We're, we're looking at all sorts of different technologies. I probably don't want to talk about the ones we're spe specifically looking at, but a lot of the you know, the cloud-based tools and the uh, the big data tools, we're, we're investigating many of those and trying to choose the right ones for our mission. You mentioned cloud. Uh, there's been historically hesitation on the part of large enterprises, particularly banks and others, to embrace cloud. Uh, I'm curious what uh, if you can comment on Scotia's particular take on, on cloud. Yeah, well, we're definitely focused on it. I think all the big banks are focused on cloud. Um, it's proceed with caution. There's no question about that. Uh, you know, the, the big challenge that I think all corporations are having right now, not just banks, is protecting our customers' data. So obviously, that's always going to be primary in our mind. So the way we're, you know, approaching the cloud is cloud in general is an untrusted zone by, by nature, the native cloud. And so we have to build the capabilities and the security mechanisms that will allow us to gradually move in that direction. Um, it, it's a very big question for, for banks and large corporations. And, you know, above all, banks are going to move very cautiously in that direction. So some of the, uh, some of the capabilities of the cloud we are exploiting, but uh, only in very uh, 
very specific ways to always put first our customers' protection. Sure, sure. And have you looked at some of the uh, data science, machine learning, AI offerings that the cloud vendors are are coming online with in particular? We have. And and for sure, uh, you know, some of these capabilities, again, are we're seeing them here at Pegaworld. You know, machine learning is a big area. It's a big uh, push. I would say, you know, we're working with it, we're experimenting with it, and again, having pockets of success with it. But in general, um, for us right now, we're starting at the bottom of the pyramid and making sure we have you know, our data layer just right and then understand how to draw the insights and intents out of that. Uh, machine learning comes a little bit later down the road when you know you've got your your decision models working the way you want them. And then you just, you know, again, you've got to have that transparency of as I'm learning, I need to be able to track where this thing is going because you've always got compliance and audit issues to be able to say why was any particular decision made. So machine learning is another area where we're going to proceed with great caution and we're going to you know, understand it very well before we start uh, making making uh, choices about how to use it. Maybe going back to the the underlying data discussion, one of the things that you mentioned that was interesting was you you've got this historical data, you've got the social data again, and then you've got this notion of the customer journey. And I'm wondering, does that notion of the customer journey? Does it exist someplace as a thing? And like, what is its native form and where does it live? Is it, you know, is it just in Pega? Is it, you know, something that you store in some database? Or is it, you know, created on the fly every time from all the these different pieces and parts? That's a great question. Um, I think it's a it's a virtual concept for sure. We don't have a customer customer journey database and we don't have a customer journey tool. Um, it's really uh, something that we we work on with the business. So the business obviously is the one who draws the customer journeys and understands them, and we support them in that uh, analysis. Um, but what I would say is it's kind of built into uh, our decision capabilities. It's built into our processes, and it's it's embodied in all of our systems. As you know, every time we're building new systems, those systems represent points on the customer journey. And so that data that comes out of those systems goes back into our data layer. And eventually you will have something that is sort of a record of customer journeys, if you will. But the the actual work that's done on behalf of the customer, the decisions that are made on behalf of the customer, those are embedded in our systems. So the concept is virtual, but there are very real artifacts of it all over the bank. What are some of the what are some of the areas that are kind of most exciting for you as you both here at the conference, you kind of see what what is happening uh, with, you know, one of your key vendors in this space, as well as just in the broader industry, you know, as machine learning, AI and other things are evolving? Well, uh, so I'm particularly interested in this concept of uh, customer centricity, and it's a big theme in many of the the vendors and many of the uh, companies that are working with customer data. And for me, it's it's going to be a real challenge to kind of step out of the comfort zone of being a product oriented or uh, you know historically companies sell products and services, and of course we'll always sell products and services. However, Customer centricity challenges us to start looking at differently at the way we bring our products and services to the customers. So, you know, as I always say, banks are not uh, are not missions, but we are customer focused organizations, and increasingly. Uh, your focus on the customer is what's going to be the deciding factor in whether customers stay with you or not. Customers are becoming m- much more demanding over time, as well they should. There's more technology and more capabilities at their disposal. So this idea that you know, if you, if you look across uh, an organization, you look across all of their systems, you've got decisions being made on behalf of your customer all over the place. And some of them are manual. You know, we're doing things in contact centers and branches and, you know, we got financial advisors. And some of them are just embedded and codified in our systems. And so the idea that we want to start to have some kind of a holistic uh, capability to think about our customer and to bring things to our customers, that's going to be a huge challenge for 
for large corporations. And, you know, we're out there now increasingly uh, competing with non-banks. And non-banks have all sorts of, uh, you know, new technologies at their disposal. So we've got to be able to compete with them on the same terms. So being more customer-centric will definitely play a role in that uh, competitive challenge. Uh, a quick question on that 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 point. Uh, you mentioned that a big part of customer centricity is having a holistic view of the customer. Does that necessarily mean centralized or must it in fact remain decentralized and we just have to deal with that? I think uh, just the nature of our systems is that you'll never have a perfect customer data record. That's that's not going to exist. But the idea and, and of... Even, uh, the specific thing that you, that you were talking about that, that triggered this question was around the different points that customer-related decisions were being made. Like, mm-hmm. is it, you know, as part of the vision of, you know, what you're doing around decision automation to, like, have a, a single place where customer decisions are made or I, I don't again I don't know if we'll ever have a single place where customer decisions are made but to the extent that we can uh, coordinate better the touch points with the customer I think that's going to be a really important uh, advance in technology so it's it's an interest for me um, I think that if you if you just put yourself in the customer's shoes for a minute and if you're receiving multiple offers from your uh, the companies that you do business with, and they may be similar enough where you're wondering, why are you sending me two offers for credit cards? I don't need two credit cards. Maybe I need one, right? Or, you know, you're offering me a credit card on this hand, and I'm talking to you about a mortgage on that hand. How are these two things going to affect each other? So I think to the extent that we can centralize at least the direct customer touch points, and you know, coordinate those and have an arbiter of uh, you know customer focus. Uh, I think that will be a, a big advance uh, that that's going to come in the next few years. So that we we really look like when you're dealing with a bank, even if you're dealing with different people, you're dealing with one bank. That's that's kind of the point. Okay, and you were getting to AI. Yeah, so I think for AI, um, and you know, we, I was sitting on a board with a few guys talking about this a little bit earlier. We're we're mastering historical data now and we're making real-time decisions as i said instead of segmented decisions and things like that so i think we're we're getting to the point where we can make the best decision make the best interaction or have the best moment with the customer now okay we're getting better at the historical aspect of that and the real-time aspect so we've overcome that first challenge um but i think a next challenge is going to be having better models for understanding how the decisions we're making with our customer right now will impact them and us in the future. So again, uh, the example I was giving today in discussion was if I'm offering a a credit card, how's that going to impact the propensity to get a mortgage later? Or, you know, if if I know that that customer may be in the market for a new car loan in in another year, is that credit card going to impact that new car loan? And what's the right offer for them and for the bank to maximize that overall equation? So I think, you know, there will be a point in time where we start looking forward and saying, how do we model out, you know, what's the next step in the customer journey, not just the previous step and the current step? I think that's going to be a really interesting set of questions that are that are brought up and discussed over the next couple of years. I've had a number of conversations with folks, and it it always strikes me that you know just where we are in the process, uh, we're optimizing around you know very much low hanging fruit, like right. you know these kind of incremental decisions right. or very simple metrics that don't necessarily tie to kind of the long term big picture total lifetime value of a customer relationship, for example. That's way out of scope for what most people are thinking about today. That's true. If you think about the financial markets, I, I part of my history was uh, doing modeling of financial instruments. And I, I used to you know, model balance sheets for banks and things like that. And you, you know, you're always looking forward and you're looking at things like volatility curves and forward curves on underlying uh, assets and things like that. And then you're modeling and you're saying, well, you know, Things can happen. I'll model out into the future, and I'll I'll take the expected value of, of that, or I'll you know uh, adjust it for probabilities, etc. And I bring it back, and I say, what's the best decision to make, looking out into the future? Well, 
you know, we are financial actors in our customers' lives. So at some point, you want to be able to take that same look forward and say, you know, this decision or this offer or whatever it is, is going to have an impact on them and is going to have expected value to us. So why don't we find a way to start looking forward a little bit and see if, you know, it's the right decision now and the right decision for the future. And I think that's going to be a, that's going to be a whole big area of analysis and learning over the next several years. We, so we've, we've talked quite a bit about the way the data tier needs to enable this and some of the things you're doing. You know, looking into the future, how do you see the, that data tier evolving to meet all of these needs? Good question. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think, as I said, I think this is going to be something that uh, evolves over time and the questions will be asked and answered by people who are smarter than I am. But uh, but I do think that uh, there we'll start getting into a little bit of, you know, uh, profiling of, you know, people and how they work and how they live and how they, you know, use financial instruments and saying, you know, the average customer who takes financial instrument like this when they're at this point in their life uses it in these ways. So you'll you'll model around that and probably have some kind of statistical modeling around it and then bring it back and say, it's our belief that this is the the tool that will take you forward in this way. And again, I don't know, but I do know that financial modeling is normally to go forward with a an expected curve and then apply, um, you know, kind of uh, statistical methods around that expected curve and say, you know, randomly things happen. How do we bring it back and understand the impact on today? Awesome. Awesome. Well, Jim, thanks so much for taking the time to sit down with me. Um, any final thoughts or any uh, words of wisdom for uh, enterprises in financial services or in other industries that are just starting out down this journey? I think if I was, uh, and again, I've been in the field for a long time. I've been 30 years uh, you know, in the IT world. I think what I would say is the game changer now is that the customer is really in charge. The customer is sophisticated. They know that we've got all kinds of capabilities and all kinds of data. They're expecting us to use it uh, to mutual benefit of ours and theirs. And so, you know, anything you're doing, if you're doing it on behalf of your customer, it's, you know, it's, it's the right path. you got to keep the customer in the center. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Jim. Pleasure to meet you. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. For more information on Jim or any of the topics covered in this episode, head on over to twimmelaicom slash talk slash 152. To follow along with the Pegaworld series, visit twimmelaicom slash Pegaworld 2018. For more information on Pega Systems or their new Pega Infinity offering, visit pega.com slash infinity. As always, thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.